You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hi there, everybody. This is Sarah, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, a podcast all about shedding limiting labels and beliefs so we can live authentically and into our full potential. You know, if you're part of the No Labels, No Limits community over at sarahbox.com, you already know we've been talking about wellness for all of ourselves, from stress and rest to renewal and restoration. And while that may not seem like a logical series of conversations for entrepreneurs and nonprofit leaders who are working on the front edge of improving the conditions and experiences for others, maybe even a little off track when you consider I'm a strategic vision coach, trust me, whole person wellness is essential to our success which is how we ended up with the guests we have today. Um, A month or so ago, we asked our community how they experience and address stress and trauma in their own lives. And I received some really personal and vulnerable responses. I received this incredible poem from a man who shared what it's like to deal with PTSD from multiple critical incident um, events. And I also received a totally different kind of response from one of our members, which was an offer to connect me to today's guest, Tavana Denise. Um, One thing about Tavana that you should know is that she helps coaches redesign their businesses so they can actually have the lifestyle and impact that they started the business for. She's a former physical therapist, master certified coach and business mentor. Tavana is the creator of Launch Therapy, which is a process that helps coaches launch their programs, um, most importantly with ease, so they can bring in their favorite clients consistently without suffering from launch burnout or hating the process. So I want you, if you're not a coach, I want you to step back and think how that applies to you as well. I can certainly think about it for myself as a coach, but also as a consultant or as someone who pulls things together for other people. You can create the best process in the world and at the end of it think, I have created a monster and I hate it and I'm out of here. So Tavana makes sure that the folks you work with do not go down that road. In addition, she is the author of Unstoppable Success, How to Finally Create the Body, Business, and Lifestyle You Want, and she's the voice behind two podcasts, Breaking Protocol and Coaching and Conversations. And when she's not handling business, as if there would be time for anything else, you can actually find her singing karaoke or enjoying the white sands and blue waters of Mexico, which she currently calls home. So with that, let's welcome our guest, Tavana Denise, a very wise, successful and insightful woman, both in business and in life. And she can speak to everything we're talking about today with insight and wisdom. Hi, Tavana. Hello, Sarah. Hey, I have been looking forward to talking to you today ever since we had that short kind of chat on Zoom maybe a month or so ago. Um, And I may have mentioned, but I do like to start by asking all of our questions, the same, all of our guests, the same question. And that's whether there's something you do every day that keeps you focused and staying in alignment with your true self, your soul's calling and your, the big goals you have in life. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to listen to motivational topics because I found for a long time, if I get too far off the path and if I don't make sure I anchor myself back to something that feeds my spirit, feeds my soul, feeds my mind, then I can go into a kind of dark place and then the world sucks and I hate everything and everyone in it. And so I just have to remind myself like every day to do that for me. Are there any particular, um, places you go or people you listen to that particularly lift you up or keep you motivated and inspired? Well, this, this might surprise you a little bit. Sometimes it's Abraham Hicks and sometimes it's comedy. So 10 minutes of laughter a day. 
<laughs> it keeps the blues the way I think. <laughs> I agree. Well, think about what laughing does. It raises your vibration, right? You can't be a grump exactly. if you're laughing. Exactly. <laughs> so I, know, I just go to YouTube and look for whatever I can find. Okay. Very resourceful. Super resourceful. I agree with you. And um, it's a nice breadth of things to consider. And it gets you out of your headspace, especially when you start going down the dark and uglies. Okay. So is there something I left out of your bio that you'd like to share? Oh, my goodness. Out of the bio. Well, how about this? Can you share a bit about your journey and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, I guess it's a, a winding journey, but I think the the medium version of it was I was, as you said, a licensed and practicing physical therapist. I had a physical therapy contracting company, but even before that, I started out in multi-level marketing with a couple of big name companies. And I had this idea in my mind, and I remember telling my uncle, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. Because I had that the first business before I even had my physical therapy license. And he, of course, put me back in my place and said, no, you're not. You have to work hard and you have to work for 20, 30 years and, you know, his path. And for a moment, I was angry and I was like, I'll show you kind of thing. But also, I think the, the, the inner child in me was like, oh, maybe he knows better. And so a little bit, I think, of me took that away and I continued to go. But some part of me also was like, no, this is your vision. Like, I don't personally believe that the creator will ever give you a vision to have something without also giving you the means to achieve it. So that stayed in my mind and I kept working on various businesses. And at some point I had an alternative fitness event company in Atlanta because I wanted to show women that exercise could be fun and that you didn't have to just be lifting weights or running. There were other ways to move your body. And I don't know if you've ever heard of, of class pass. It's an app that prior to the pandemic, I don't know how they're doing now, but it was started by a woman had a billion dollar valuation prior to the pandemic. And I was like, Oh, Oh, I had class pass before that was the thing, but I just didn't have the technology to go with it. So, you know, talk about being too early to the party, not tardy for the party. I was too early to it. And so at some point that was in 2012, 2014, I went and got certified as a life and a weight coach. And that was the first time that I ever learned that my thoughts created my reality, that if I ever felt a negative way, I could just change the way that I was thinking about the circumstance of the situation. And almost immediately I felt better. I'm like, why didn't they teach me this in school? Do you know how miserable I was? All I had to do was change how I think. And so it felt like somebody had just given me the keys to the universe. And I wanted to share it with everybody. I guess like most of us, when we find something good, we wanna share it with people. But it was more challenging than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and um, I went through a space of, am I meant to do this? Is this, do, does anybody care? Should I keep going or should I give up? This is harder than I thought it was going to be. And eventually that, I think that little voice piped up and remembered the dream of not just being a millionaire, but I saw myself in a stadium talking to lots of people and helping lots of people. Like I, I was a physical therapist because I love helping people, but something always said like, you're supposed to help more people. And I think that's what the stadium represented for me in that vision. And so I think that's what really kept me going all of these years. And so one could say from when I first started with my coaching certification in 2014 to 2020, it took me six years to make my first six figures in one year from coaching. And I think that's one of the things that you and I connected on, Sarah, is like sometimes people think that it's going to just be this whirlwind rush and speed to six figures or more. And it's that doesn't happen to everybody. <laughs> Well, certainly it doesn't happen to everybody and it happens on different 
timetables, right? Mm -hmm. And honestly, the goal for some people may not even be that like six figures. It may be something entirely different, right? So I think that's part of the um, what interests me is like, how do we define success? So you, from a young age, had a pretty clear vision for yourself of what is success going to look like numerically, even if that number changed, right? And then you were able to say, I'm going to be talking in a stadium, whether that was literal or figurative, right? It connected to your heart, like I'm going to reach all these people, right? Two really concrete things of success that you can say, am I reaching a broad group of people and helping them? You know, yes or no. So um, I want to back up a little bit, though. So you said something. You said, then I wanted to share this that you discovered with everybody. What is the this that you discovered? Just the for so long, I had been taught or observed maybe that other people and circumstances were responsible for my feelings. Like he made me mad. She hurt my feelings. Um, because whatever the circumstances, the, the manager is a terrible person and he never listens to my ideas. And that was the reason to me why I couldn't get ahead or I can't build my business to a bigger level because I have to go to work. Like all of these things I thought were the reason for me being where I was. And when I realized that just changing how I looked at the things that I was looking at, changing my perspective, changing my opinion, changing my thoughts about those things gave me, it raised my vibration because it changed my feeling from resentful too grateful in the in the example of I can't build my business because I have to go to work. Well, then when I looked at work as like, oh, I don't have to worry about how many clients I have because I have my bills paid already. Now I'm grateful to go to work. Circumstance didn't change. They didn't give me more money. They didn't give me time off. But now I'm looking at it as a source of, oh, OK, one need is met so that I am free to go do something else without putting stress and pressure on my business. And so that is the, that, that I was talking okay. about. No, I agree with you. And I was hoping that was kind of where you're going with it because it seems, well, first of all, it's, you don't need anything special to be able to do that. Right. You just have to have the willingness to reframe and tell yourself a different story, which isn't lying to yourself, but it's really going, what does this current circumstance actually make possible for me? Even though I don't want to be here now, what's it making possible? Um, so yes, I may not wanna be, I might not like that manager, but what's it making possible for me? A little forbearance, staying focused on why I'm here and the people I'm helping and being ready to go, right? Having that runway time, if you will, to go. So what is one of the best questions that would, and I'm assuming I'm projecting, we're never there, right? We have to remind ourselves of this stuff. You never reach this pinnacle where you're going, nothing bothers me anymore. Um, <laughs> right. To me, Sarah, this is like, especially for people who have been involved in personal development, self-development, who go get the certifications as coaches, we sometimes get to this place in our mind where we quote unquote should feel amazing all the time and we should know better. And I would say two things to that. One is if we don't have the rain, we don't appreciate the sunshine. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is we don't get upset that we have to shower every day to clean ourselves or brush our teeth every day to clean our teeth is just something that we do for maintenance. And so I, I have tried to start looking at it like this. I just have a human brain. This is just what brains do. They come up with, they're trying to protect me. They're going to look for all the danger and they're going to try to keep me safe. So this is just what it's doing, like plaque coming on the teeth. So I'm just going to brush my teeth every day. Let's clean it out. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about one of the reasons that I wanted to get dive in more with you is, you know, your whole launch 
project you do and helping people is really to help them get through or past previous or maybe even anticipated launch trauma, right? So it was mm -hmm. that trauma piece that really drew me to you from launching a new concept or a program or whatever you're launching, but really in that sense of trauma, because when I talk to people in my business and then colleagues and you know many people like yourself, when I'm interviewing them before we go live, we're having these one-off conversations. And the level of stress and trauma that we have, I don't want to say become accustomed to, but we've been subjected to, you know, collectively across mm -hmm. the globe. Um, can you talk a bit more about trauma, what the small traumas are? Because I think sometimes, unless someone says, well, I wasn't in that catastrophic event, I wasn't in the hurricane, I wasn't at that, whatever it was, right? So I must, my trauma, I have stress, not trauma. Yeah. So can you talk about that? Yeah. So sometimes trauma is referred to as big T and little t trauma. And so what you were describing there, catastrophic events, um, that, that's what most people point to when they think of trauma, the big T traumas. And what we're talking about, and I'll give you an example of what I see to be the difference between stress and little T trauma is to me, trauma is we know that we're in a place of trauma when we have a disproportionate response to the stimulus. And I'll give you an, a very personal example of something that happened recently. When I work with people in terms of their launching their business, launching their programs, one of the types of PTSD that I have seen comes up, it, I call it visibility PTSD. And for me, what we have seen is the most common example one might think of is a child who has is asked to read aloud in front of the class. Maybe they stutter or stammer and the, the kids laugh. And so that's forever encoded in that person's DNA in, in their excuse me, in their nervous system as danger. Don't go there. This will separate you from the pack. Remember, the brain is always trying to keep us comfortable, trying to keep us alive, trying to keep us safe. So that becomes something that most people they're afraid of speaking again in front of the group or if they're asked to answer a question in business what i find is if you are trolled or you have the haters come after you on you post something that you think is amazing and someone comes after you for that not just okay let's have a discussion or discourse like they really are coming after you the body the nervous system i'm not even it, you can logically say well this person's on the internet they can't hurt me whatever but in the body the body codes that is danger mayday fear i gotta get away and then we have trouble showing up again for our business so what happened to me around two 2015, I put a post up, which is something that I still maintain to this day, that in order to make money in your business, especially in the beginning, you do not need a full on website. You just don't. You need a web presence potentially, but when we say need, that's a very strong word. So that was my stance. And this person proceeded to follow, like argue with me in the comments because he was a website designer. So it makes kind of makes sense. But he was arguing with me, so I took the post down, deleted all the comments. He proceeded to follow me around the, the internet to the point where he got my personal cell phone number and continued to make threats. Now, at that point, I am terrified because now I don't know to what lengths this person is gonna go. Do they, like, where are they? I don't know them, they know where I am. And so I, in that moment, chose to go offline for 18 months because I just could not get myself to go back on. Like no personal posts to friends and family, no nothing. So that's what the incident was. And people say time heals all wounds, but that's not necessarily true. Remember I said that was 2015. This is at the time of recording 2020. As recent as eight weeks ago, I was being coached about being visible in a bigger way in my business. And that memory came up. And in an instant, while I was being coached on Zoom, began shaking and crying because I felt the terror of that person coming to get me. 
or to harm me physically because of my own thoughts online. To me, that is an example of PTSD. Yep. Seven years after the fact, somebody just talking to me about something triggers me to start shaking and crying. That is not stress. That to me is a PTSD, a traumatic response. So when we think about the, the standard responses to trauma, fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, that's what we see happen in response. Like I was like frozen, I couldn't do anything. Let's stay in those four Fs for a couple of minutes, okay? Um, mm -hmm. First of all, that was a perfect example because anybody who's been online may be able to resonate with that. We just had an incident two weeks ago. And the first comment I saw that I'm thinking, who are you? Where, this is not my community. I don't know who you are and why are you so nasty, right? So I thought, mm -hmm. peace out, I'm not reading it. If that's the tone, because it engenders more of the same. And I'm thinking, have at it, you guys. But my online business manager said, oh yeah, I tried to navigate that. I didn't want you seeing it. And I says, take it down, I don't care. You know, I, I'm not, because I know that feeling in me of being vulnerable and like not to the degree you're talking about there, not where someone haunt, did that, but where it was mm -hmm. like, where do I go from here? Like, what's my safe space? Um, right. My coping mechanism is not pleasant. So it's like, I don't even want to go there. But when you think about the four F's, so you talked about the fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Um, mm -hmm. What, which of those was that for you? And are there healthy and unhealthy ways of experiencing those four? Mm. So for me in that particular case, it's, it was freeze because every time I, because how it presented, I kept going to my coach and I was saying, I, I'm so confused. I don't know what to post. I don't know what to write about. And you see me right now. I have plenty to say about it, but I just kept saying, I'm so confused. I don't know what to say. And she's like, you, you, you talked for 15 minutes without stopping about this thing. What do you mean? So it, it seemed very innocent. Right. And so then when I would get past that, then it would be like, well, I, I have so much to say. I don't know where to start. Right. So it was me freezing. Like I had, I was incapacitated. I could not get my words out on paper. And so that that's how it showed up. Some people, it shows up as flight, they, I don't know if you've experienced this, Sarah, where you're working with somebody and you get to a place and then they ghost, like they're not present anymore. You're like, wait, I have. Uh, where, 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 and they paid you too. It's not like they're trying to skip out on the bill. They're paid. I'm like, what is happening? And then the fight shows up as like sometimes resistance or combativeness in, in the tone. And you're like, but that was your idea. Why are you fussing at me? I'm trying to help you. I'm just mirroring the, here. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I'm on your side. Wait a minute. <laughs> and, then, and then the fawn is, and this is one is a little bit interesting because it's where people acquiesce and they kind of go along with something that they know they don't want to go along with because that's, again, they don't want to be separated from the group. So rather than go with what's in alignment, what's true with them, they'll just do what the rest of the group or their coach or whomever says. So that's more of the go along to get along mentality. It's like, I'm not going to rock the boat. I'm just going to put my head down and keep going. Exactly. That's, that's a good exactly. way to think about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and I don't know that to your second question, I don't know that there is a healthy versus an unhealthy way to display those. I think just understanding what your trauma response is so that you can ask for help or so that you can go a little bit introspective and say, okay, well, what's really true and present for me in this moment? Because it didn't make any sense. Like she said, logically, I knew plenty about the topic. So it, it, the two didn't match up. And so one of the things when I'm working with people is getting intimate and aware with what is, what are your signs? What are your, what activates you or your triggers? Sometimes they call it like, how do you know that you're in this kind of response? And then how do you, how do you soothe yourself? How do you learn to be with that so that you can calm the nervous system down? 
So maybe that's a better way to come at the question I was asking is how do we attend to our needs in those situations, right? So had you not been working with your coach, would you have had the awareness or the um, distance to be able to say, oh, I'm having a trauma response to something very real in the past that is freaking me out right now. And yes, of course, I have plenty to say. I mean, would you have been able to recognize that? Or did you in that moment need someone to give you a frame? So the next time, if it comes up, you can go, I've been here before. I know what this is. I think it's a sometimes is the answer. So sometimes I recognize I'm like, oh, there that is again. And it's a matter of, okay, what's really going on right now? How are you feeling? Like I just literally start talking to myself. Hey, how are you feeling? Because it's usually one of the little inner children. Like they're at the different ages. There are certain things that happen in our life that mark certain patterns. And it's like, hey, what's going on? Hey, what do you need? I what's I okay you're angry I get that and just be with and it I like the idea of the inner children some people say the inner child but I just say inner children because it's different ages different things happen to us and it also kind of gives us a little bit of a roadmap if you will for how to self-soothe because if we think of it as one of our inner children, how would you behave with a child? If a child was having a hissy fit or throwing a tantrum, how would you speak to them? How would you be with them? Would you just sit next to them and hold them? Would you just, would you say, hey, I understand what what you're going through. You have every right to be angry right now, right? And I like doing that because so often if we get in, a lot of us get in our heads and we're so used to, being like the drill sergeant, like get your act together, you know, and, and that that's not really helpful when your nervous system is on high alert. And so that's part of the reason why I like thinking about how would I talk to a child in this instance? That approach has helped me. I mean, I think I've evolved it over the years, but oftentimes I think, you know what, just be nice to yourself right now. Like I wanted to feel great yesterday, but I was really resentful about some stuff that was happening, not in my control at all, right? And I'm out driving around and I'm having a conversation with myself. Hey, Sarah, is this feel good what you're doing right now? The thoughts that are in your head? And I said, why don't you just take control of your thoughts and let them go? And what would be fun? What would be creative? And I thought, oh, let's go bake something. I'm not a baker. I'm not, I'm not good at it, but I thought, let's go bake something easy and hopefully tasty that you can give to somebody. Right? But, but honestly, right. I had a list of things to do, but it was like, I'm thinking, okay, what would I wanted to do as a kid? Be creative with the least hassle possible. And um, I could, other people could be around. I don't want them to play with me. I want to like be in my head and make stuff up. But honestly, giving myself that grace instead of saying, you know better than this. You should just knock it off, show up and serve, right? Or do whatever. Um, I just needed that space. But there are times where I've just doubled down, like you're saying, get the drill sergeant going and do more, do more, do more. Mm -hmm. So um, I like your approach to that. And I do think they are children, you know. Do you ever have a committee meeting with all the kids? Not Not at the same time, but sometimes we do have board meetings with one of the inner children because usually when I'm working with myself or somebody in their business, it's usually one person in particular that's like causing a ruckus. So we get with that person and we also get with the future self. So like the self that already has. Yeah, the the one that already has everything that we want, they know the way, they know how we got there. So we get the the two of them together plus current. So we got past, present, and future. And that's who is at the board meeting, if you will. So talk a little bit about that, because that appeals. um, That's not exactly like just visualizing. It's actually accepting that that person already exists. Your future person exists, right? And has the answers. So 
how would you coach somebody to even think about that? You know, like, are there specific questions or processes? So, I mean, I don't, yes, I would say, but the, it's about building a relationship. Okay. So in the beginning, like where you were saying for your inner child, you've evolved it. So you just have a nice conversation with yourself. Like, hey, Sarah, what's going on? So some people have to make that child small because they would never be mean or speak rudely or harshly to a child as they would an adult. So we start with the child and then we get to the adult where it's just normal for you to speak kindly to yourself. Then the same thing with building a relationship and the trust with the future self, like it has to become more of a regular uh, practice of saying, okay, I know that, and I said this earlier, I don't believe that the creator would give any of us a vision to have something without also giving us the means to achieve it. So if that is the premise that we're going off of, this person has what I want and they know the answer. They know how we got there. So it's just a matter of like meditating and thinking, how, how did we get there? There was a place in time. So if that's too far of a stretch for anybody listening, think about right now, there was a point in time where whatever we have access to, whatever we're doing, there was a past version of ourselves that was like, that would be so off, awesome if I could do blank. Or the kid in us is looking like, oh my gosh, you get to drive a car? You can drive? Like we were, there are certain things that we do now that we never thought that we would be able to do years ago. And so there's a part of me that is like, oh my gosh, you live in Mexico? Like there, there was a place, 2007, I read The 4-Hour Work Week by Tim oh, Ferriss. I well, know. Changed my life. And, and that was when this was born, where it's like, I'm going to be able to live and work anywhere. So in 2007, there was the version of me that I could have, if I knew that, if I had the tool to say, hey, version of you that lives in Mexico, how did we get there? And that's it's like you're saying, it is building that relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the things I and this is totally off, but I wanted to ask you where, or I'm making an assumption here. So, but how or where do um, courage, commitment, and conviction intersect? Do they at all intersect in your work and how you think about things? Mm. There's actually <laughs> so interesting those words that you use. I created something called the success cycle once and what how how it works is whenever you are uncomfortable enough where you finally decide we're not wishing we're not hoping we're not trying you're like i'm going to commit that i'm going to have this thing be do or have this thing that's where commitment comes in and then there's a freak out that happens so say you pay the personal trainer or whatever it is and then you freak out like oh they're going to take all of my potato chips away you know that kind of thing and then afterwards there requires, or, or it's like, I don't know how to work out in the gym. All the people are gonna be looking at me like that's the freak out after you commit. Cause if you're just thinking about it or hoping or wishing, none of that stuff comes up. But once you commit, the brain, remember it's trying to keep you comfortable and safe, is gonna do what it, it does to keep us in our current lane. So then it requires a bit of courage to take the first step and then consistency to keep on stepping. And so I guess that would be your conviction at that point to keep moving forward. And I call that part of the cycle, the gauntlet, because it, it does not feel good. Mm -hmm. But once you get past those three points, you get to, uh, cons to um, competence and clarity, where you know what to do and how to do it. And from there you reach confidence. And what I find is so many people want the confidence without going through the courage, without going through the consistency the of conviction. All right. They want, they want that. And so once you get to that place where you're confident and you know what to do, you know what, how to do it, you're confident, then you drop into the comfort zone. And because we are beings that evolve, 
eventually that comfort zone becomes uncomfortable. It becomes discomfort and you want to grow again. You make another commitment and you drop back into the cycle. So folks, we're never just going to be cruising along, feeling perfect all the time. We're going through our gauntlets. That's just how it works. Yeah. And at the top side, so if the gauntlet was the bottom half of the cycle, the top side is where the identity starts to shift. So for the, anything that we've ever done, we go through the gauntlet. And then once we're in that identity piece, then we get into the comfort zone. So as far as the identity goes, and I'm thinking about this in terms of your work specifically with business and entrepreneurship or people who are leaving like um, when you started like leaving maybe healthcare and coming into something else, that mm -hmm. whole identity and being willing to take a different identity, that's tough stuff, especially if you've been lauded and lifted up for who you've been in the past or the child you've been, how do you help people with that? Ooh, buddy, that is, that is, Sarah, that is the work. That is the work. So soothing the nervous system, knowing that you are okay and perfect if you never do any of those things, but also making a shift into that next identity. So say I wasn't, you were, or whoever was in healthcare, and now they're going into coaching or consulting. That is a different identity that we got to go through. Can, can I do it? Um, can I get clients? We go through all of that. And then after a while, it's like, if you if your, convic your conviction is there, your consistency is there, then there gets to be a point where you know how to do it, you know what to do, you're confident in your skill, you're like, oh, I got this, I am a coach, I am a consultant. But that, that gauntlet of changing the identity is rough for a lot of people. And it, but it's so important because I noticed, especially working with a lot of people in healthcare, they have the titles, right? They have all of the letters behind the name. And if we don't start to change the identity, it will hurt our business. It will hurt our income because I don't, this is not scientific research. It's just anecdotal. <laughs> but what I noticed was when I was doing networking events and some of my clients would still introduce themselves as I am Dr. So-and-so, I'm a physical therapist or I'm a doctor or I'm a nurse or whatever, they weren't making money in their business. But as we kept doing those events, the moment they started saying, I'm a life coach, I'm a health coach, I'm the founder of whatever, within two weeks, they started making money. They started owning who they were, their mm -hmm. new, their future them. Right. That is powerful. And it is, it's, I've had recent conversations about this with folks. It's like, why is that so important to have all the, the qualifications? Cause you already have the qualifications, right? But it's that whole, but I'll lose esteem. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking you already, you already got the esteem, right? That doesn't go away. You're, you're trusted. You, you're magnificent, you know? So, and I make light of it, but that's big, big work big work to do and it's not easy it truly is well i liked that you um talked about never being given a vision for which you won't also be given the means to achieve it so i embrace that with you um i do want to ask you um i have a feeling or a belief that every good coach every good leader has someone who's helped them along the way, get where they are, or many people. So um, currently, or in the recent past, who is someone you've worked with that's really helped shape how you're able to do what you do so successfully? Mm, I would say Brooke Castillo. She is the founder of the Life Coach School. And she's the reason I know that my thoughts create my results, not my circumstances. So... On that note, what is, oh, oh, I got one more question for you. Sorry, I just thought about this. I was thinking about you in Mexico and what I said that you'd be singing karaoke. But what our listeners don't know is that you used to sing backup, actually, for a yeah. new soul band. So was that, when you were little, was did you dream of being a professional singer? No, not no. at all. <laughs> no, well, I was going to be a doctor. <laughs> No, but um, my my dad 
always loved to sing. We would sing in the car all the time. And he used to get us so bad. He would put stuff on. We'd be singing at the top of our little lungs. And at any point in time, he would turn the volume all the way down to catch us in the middle. It was great. Um, but no, not, no, I never thought about okay. singing professionally. And it's my brother's fault, actually, because when I went back, I went to school in Florida. So when I got back to the DC area, he was singing for a band and they lost one of the background singers. And I would just wanted to watch him one day at rehearsal. And he was like, well, my sister can sing. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm just here watching the practice. And so that's how I ended up. I got, got up there and uh, I stayed with them for about a year and we recorded an album. How cool is that? Well, the singing doctor, you, you know, I just think music plays an important role in our lives, you know, and I was just curious if that was something you'd consider doing before, but you're still being a doctor in many different ways today. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the best way um, for folks to get a hold of you? Where do you like people to reach you? Yeah, well, I think the easiest way would be going straight to my website. There's a contact form, TavanaDenise.com, and that's T-A-V as in Victor, O-N-A, Denise, D-E-N-I-S-E, dot com, and at Tavana Denise at Instagram, if you happen to be on Instagram. Okay, well, we'll make sure that's in the show notes. And any parting words of wisdom or what you would tell your Tavana at eight years old about the path that lays ahead of her. Oh my goodness. It's going to be quite the roller coaster ride. And none of anything that happens to you means that there's something wrong with you. Ooh, I take that one to the bank all mm -hmm. the way. So I want to thank you for being a guest on the No Labels, No Limits podcast. And listeners, if you got value from this interview, which I know you did, um, I would really encourage you to go check Tavana out. And then when you've done that, share this episode with somebody else who needs to hear what she's saying, because in my heart of hearts, there are no accidents. She's on this episode for a reason. One of you has had your life changed by listening to her. So spread that word to somebody else. And we'll see you back here next week for another episode. Thanks, Tavana. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.